Hello, and welcome to another episode of My Dinner with Gabe, with Gabe Van Handel and... And Zav LaPlay. Yeah, that's us. And we're a film review show where we review movies and talk about movies and have guests on that make movies and Mm -hmm. talk about movies and it's a big movie show. Yeah. So, So here we are. We this, haven't had a guest for a while. We haven't actually. had a guest for a while, so and Mark Borchardt. Because I think we've been just too busy. But normally we have someone who's making film or doing something in the film community. Mm-hmm. Um, oh. It's been a while, but that's okay. We're kind of re, we're sort of re, re-figuring um, our show out. Yeah, we're re rethinking or recon reconceiving our mm-hmm. uh, recipe. Mm-hmm. We're recreating our recipe. We're taking six months off. And then we're going to come back with a whole new set of recipes <laughs> Which is for this show. What Zav is referring to with that last statement <laughs> is to a movie that we're reviewing today, El Bulli, which is about the infamous, I'm sorry, not infamous, the famous world-renowned restaurant, El Bulli, which is right now considered the most influential restaurant in the world in terms of cuisine and experience and heightened culinary mindfulness. It's and after seeing this movie, I really, I I have to agree, and I know why. I know what the legend is all about, Mm -hmm. and the filmmaking of the movie behind this behind this restaurant. That's a small, like, little capsule of what this restaurant really represents in in the real world, is a work of art unto itself. But we'll get to that later. This is our food show. So after our box office and movie news, which we do every week. And we're going to change this up a little bit this week. Zav's going to get involved, and he's going to take half the reins on the box office news this week, and we're going to have we're going to have a back and forth. We're going to have a boxing match. It's going to be That's awesome. That's part of our new recipe. It's our new recipe. We're, 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 we're adding some cumin, some coriander, and some Zav. Uh, and some Zav. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! This um, it can okay, only so can only get better after last week's show. How do we do this? You, you have to kind of. I was sure. just telling you, you got to walk me through. Sure, this a sure, little sure. Bit. So, so, no, no, no. Go ahead and just tell me. I'll. Okay, sorry. It, Gabe has to come over and show me. Box up his mojo. Okay. And then these are the two new releases of the week. The so new sorry, releases the of the week. So the possession is the possession. Twenty one million dollars. Made twenty one million dollars. So that's the total gross. That's the total gross. Lawless. Open Lawless. Second. Open second. With twenty. With twelve million. With twelve. I can read. <laughs> I can read, Gabe. <laughs> with twelve million eight hundred seventy-two thousand dollars. Yeah, twelve point. Nine, really, if you're rounding up. If you're rounding um, up. Do I, you want me to keep going? Expendables? Just do the top ten, yeah. Uh, the Expendables made 11455 uh, 11, 11 million? Million. Did I say 11000 That's fine. And it's, um, and it's third week? Is this its third week out? Yeah. Cool. Th- in three weeks. Um, then after that is Born Legacy, which made $9 million in four weeks. So it's a little bit not doing as well, you know, financially. Um, you want me to keep going? P- Paranorman, eight million, eight thousand uh, in its third week. Uh, Which for a stop motion film is 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 okay. Uh huh. Uh huh. Oh yeah, right, right. That's what you say every week. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Odd Life of Timothy Green. What's that one about? That is a film that my nieces and nephews went to go see this weekend, which is a very sappy, very trite movie about a couple who cannot have children and a child comes out of the ground and it's a mm. very, it's could have been a very inventive movie and it ends up just being a very sentimental movie and yeah. it's not making a- as much money as they hope because word of mouth and critical reception to it is very poor. Have you ever seen the film called Otik or the, what is it called? Something Otik? Little Otik? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's a Svankmeyer? I know what you're talking about, yeah. Where it's a little, son. Little pay- Otek. Yeah. 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 Otik. Otik, yeah, you're right. Otik. Um, and they, he, he's like, comes from a root in the backyard. Mm-hmm. He's a, this uh, childless son. The couple has a son that comes from a root in the backyard. But it's not, it's, it's kind of got adults. It's not really a child. It's not really made for children. It's more made sure. for grown ups. Yeah. And it's a Czech film, I believe, or something, um, Eastern Bloc. Mm-hmm. I forget which country, maybe Hungarian or Czech. Zankmeyer? He's from Sweden. No, no, no. Zankmeyer? No, no. Is he Czechoslovakian? Yeah, he's either like Hungarian or I Czech. I think he's Czech. Or, I think you're right. I think he's Czech. Some, yeah. One of those in that in that region, like the Balkans or something. Sure. I'd have to look it up. 
Um, okay, so that's what the odd life of Timothy Green. Um, that one is uh, sixth in, in sixth in terms of um, box office sales after three weeks. It made eight million. Then you jump to the Dark Knight Rises, which is at seven, made seven million, almost eight million in its seventh week. Still holding on strong. Still hold, is Not a okay. Surprise. That's strong. That's considered strong. Oh yeah, it's almost almost a half a billion. Oh, it's it's it, it it's one of the it, it's one of the successes, which I will get to at the end at the end of our box office news. After Zav reads the how is Obama's America char- 2016 Obama's America? We should review that film. I want to see it before it leaves the 2016 yeah. Obama's America. That's a that's that conservative that. documentary that we talked about right. the other week. Oh man, I just I just want to see it just to see what that. I just can't believe a film. Even if it was, I mean, I don't care what it would be about. It just seems like how, how could a film just with that title be of something people want to go watch, you know? Um, it seems so depressing. Um, okay. So now what? What do we do now? What's the next thing? Was that the end of the box office? Well, that was those ones. Uh, you want me to keep going all the way? Oh, Just a 10. Oh, okay. So then um, the next one, the campaign, after Obama's America 2016. And the campaign is ninth? The campaign is ninth place uh, with almost as much, $7 million. Um, and then Hope Springs. Oh, and that's in its fourth week. Uh, Hope Springs in its fourth week as well. Uh, grossed $6 million. Buckaroos, and that is your box office. Labor Day weekend is generally a pretty slow weekend. Um, movies overall gross a fair amount of money because people go to movies in a fair amount, but there's not usually a big breakthrough hit. People usually, and this is a phenomenon that they haven't been able to pin down, that people go to mo- movies that have been around for at least a couple of weeks more than like a major release. So movies that come out at Labor Day weekend, it's kind of like a death sentence in terms of it definitely not breaking any records. However, The Possession came out. Lionsgate, PG-13, horror film, not mm-hmm. anything new from Lionsgate, but it was a surprisingly impressive debut and the second strongest Labor Day de- debut ever. Mm. Not as impressive. However, the, the debut is not as impressive as other been there, done that Lionsgate horror films like The Last Exorcism or Haunting in Connecticut, both of which came out within the last two years and released tw- and, and made $23 million, just av- average films that, that premiered at number one. Uh, the seven-day haul of $21.1 million for the, for the possession is the second, like I said, the second strongest Labor Day weekend behind the 2007 uh, Rob Zombie Halloween remake, which grossed $30 million, which was an unexpected huge hit for Lionsgate. Mm. This is the third, and now I'm going to talk about Lionsgate real quick. This is the third week in a row for the top spot going to Lionsgate. The Expendables 2 holding the top spot the last two weeks. April and March, the Hunger Games held on for four weeks. So that totals seven weeks this year that Lionsgate has held the top spot at the box office, Mm. which considering it's a fledgling, it's still an independent company and it's still struggling with, with bankruptcy. It's, I mean, it's been teetering on the edge, but this year really proved that Lionsgate is a major contender, a major studio, and can hold its own, and is no longer Universal's bastard stepchild. Yeah. Uh, that it's its own studio. In, in fact, it tied with Universal and Sony. Well, so tell me something about Lionsgate. Where do they come from? What's the origin? Lionsgate was was originally a an, an independent d- distributor of of of, uh, of 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 very independent fare, very outspoken fare, and studio fare. They picked mm. up movies from Sundance and from Toronto and mm-hmm. from, from other film festivals and they released a lot well, of foreign films. who started it? Do you know? Or Lionsgate, do you know anything about... Lionsgate's been around for a long time and it was originally, um, it, it, it's an offshoot of the Studio Canal okay. and it's a, it's just, it, it's, it was originally a, uh, oh, I can't remember what country, but it, it originally was a foreign, just a, 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 just a, just a, only foreign films. They they distributed foreign films in the states. Oh really? And they were owned by um, they were sub uh, subsidiary of Universal Pictures. So when you saw a Lionsgate movie, it was always released on Universal DVD, Universal Home Video, um, oh, okay. and stuff like that. And back when back when the logo was was the lion in the sky with the little red stars, which which was its logo for a long time. Yeah. It was it was owned partially by Universal and it was under Universal. Universal had its hand in its in you know how like major studios have their indie art house division. Yeah. Like Sony, um, Columbia Pictures and TriStar have their in, have their independent division, the Sony Pictures Classics, yeah, and, which is uh, my personal favorite. They they just they distribute amazing films by and large. They're they're mm-hmm. they're 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 a, a standard for for almost always a great film. Um, 
Focus Features, which also distributes and makes great films, is actually just Universal Pictures under a different logo. Um, Warner Independent was around for a while, and that and that fell under. Fox Searchlight is is 20th Century Fox's independent division, which mm -hmm. also distributes and makes great films. Mostly, they acquire films from studios. Right. Lionsgate distributed a lot of uh, films from from other studio from uh, from films overseas, and then they started to dabble into producing their own films in the states. And they got they tried to get out of the art house circuit and make their own films. However, they like did a complete 180. They started making crap because so yeah. they, they, they'd released the Saw films. So they started releasing these horror films, and that's their most profitable niche right now is like PG-13 horror films that are really, really just throwaway. They they, uh -huh. they, they want that big have opening. Have you seen weekend. the Saw films? I have. I've seen up. I've seen the first three of them, and I just uh -huh. have absolutely no interest in seeing any of any of the other four uh -huh. whatsoever. They're really bad movies, and I mean, Lionsgate literally has a huge niche in five and four or five markets: the bad PG thirteen horror film, the bad horror film. Uh, they've recently um, started a, a huge market with Tyler Perry. With all, the, they distributed all the Medea films, which were surprise hits when 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 Medea's Family Reunion came out. When uh, I'm sorry, Diary of a Mad Black Woman came out, people were like, "What is this movie? And why is it making hundreds of millions of dollars?" Yeah, they just were clueless. So th those movies made a. T I mean, that, those movies put Lionsgate on the map. The Jason Statham uh, action films are are another niche that they're big into, and just low budget but very violent, very extreme action films. And now their latest niche is. Late twenties, early thirties, pseudo intelligent Judd Apatow ripoff romantic comedies, mm. uh, like Friends with Kids and What to Expect When You're Expecting. Both of which think they're a lot smarter than they really are. Mm. But so that's the story on Lionsgate. That's ex yeah. and and I wanted to just get that out there because this I think this is the company that could. They had a big year this year with with the Hunger Games, yeah, being uh, their their biggest, most profitable film to date and one of the big successes of the year. Oh, people hate that film, though. A lot of people hate it, but a lot of people are like, oh, I just was entertained. Or I had to I, watch it just because it's yeah. to see it. A, lo see a lot of people ask me how it is, and I just want to not say anything. I want to disappear. I watched a little of it, and it looked good, but I haven't seen the whole thing. It's entertaining. I, I mean, I mean, I I've only I, heard bad things. I panned it on the show, but the more I think uh, about it, the more I'm like, it's it's not as terrible. So finishing up box office and movie news, Lawless did okay. The movie that opened second, it literally just did okay. That's all. Uh -huh. That's what I've been reading about. The Oogie Loves. Now here's a record setter. Oogie Loves and the Big Balloon Adventure is the worst debut for a movie in more than 2,000 theaters, which is called a wide national release. Then the second worst per theater average at $206 per theater. What, what that means is that on average, about one person was present per screening or showing of this movie. Wow. Like I said, this set a record. This is the worst debut for a movie in more than 2,000 theaters nationwide. This made... This movie opened 26th at the box office, beating Delgo, which is the notorious flop from 2006, taking that movie off of its shoulder of Shinola shoot poop fame. So that is your... B oh, and let me do a quick... Su Actually, you know what? I'm not going to bore you with that. But this year's summer had, had some hits and some misses. The big misses this summer, Dark Shadows and Battlefield and John Carter. The big successes this summer, The Dark Knight Rises, mm -hmm. The Avengers, and if you include The Hunger Games in the summer movie th season, which I kind of do, that's a, that's a success. The other two sleeper successes of the year was Ted, which only cost $50 million and grossed well over $200 million. Huge success story for Universal. And... Uh, Magic Mike, which only cost eight million and grossed well over 110 million at the box office, huge success story there for Warner Brothers. That is your box office news. Now Zav and I are going to try something new with the opening movies. What we're going to do is we're pretty much going to solely rely on Rotten Tomatoes, which is a site that most of I, a lot of people are familiar with, and we're basically just going to summarize them for you. So opening this week, September 7th. There's, there's several releases, but we're going to focus on the three major releases, mm -hmm. which is what we usually tend to do. We, if we covered everything that opened every week, we'd be talking for the whole show about it. Right. The Cold Light of Day is the major new release, and it wasn't screened for critics, which means it's probably pretty bad. So, Zav, why don't you give them a summary of what the plot of that movie is about? Uh, well, it says here, Will Shaw, played by Henry Cavill, mm -hmm. uh, goes to Spain for a 
week-long sailing vacation with his family, but his whole world turns upside down <laughs> when the family is kidnapped by intelligence agents hell-bent on recovering a mysterious briefcase <laughs> and Will suddenly finds himself <laughs> on the run. Um, well, right away, I'm sort of like, at first it sounded interesting, you know, Will, Sh I mean, of course, I haven't seen the film yet, but Will Shaw goes to Spain for a week-long sailing vacation with the family, but his whole world turns upside down when the family, that's up to there, I was interested, Yeah, is kidnapped by intelligence agents <laughs> and it just is they're totally just like oh, been there, come done on. That. yeah exactly been there done that what's the percentage and then rating? a mysterious briefcase of all things <laughs> it's, uh, uh, surrounding a briefcase it wasn't screened for critics but what is the percentage of critics that that, that that's on there um the well, the 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 percentage is ten percent. Oh, it went means. down from what from where it was at earlier. It was at fifteen percent uh, uh, earlier this morning when I checked it, and which means 28 that twenty eight percent is the audience. The audience, audience score doesn't really matter because score. sometimes, like the literally the worst film of the year, can get out like a ninety percent audience score. Uh -huh. Like Transformers three, which is. If you really like Transformers 3, you might not like our show right. very much, but that got like a huge audience score, but critic score it got like 5% or something like right. that. And also, I mean, you can imagine the people who make these films go to Rotten Tomatoes and and also score it just as much as anyone else. So. Oh, just to get the and audience their family score up. Members to try, yeah. Yeah, everybody probably goes in there. But you and, can't really do that with critics. And they hire critics, yeah, critics yeah. are official people yep. who work at different mm -hmm. journals mm -hmm. and are on so this movie, staff. This movie got horrible reviews, and it's just a predictable thriller. So I don't know if you. If, when are it, we going to be critics? When it, are we going to be critics that people like go go to for? Well, that's kind of my goal for a year from now. Is okay. that is that something that has we changed. somehow end up being like having an effect on, you know, what critics' choices were that uh, week? Maybe. That, yeah, I would that, love that. A, I would love that, but we'll we see. Got, we got a lot of work to. We do. got a lot of work to do. Holy crap! Yeah. So another movie that came out that, that that's coming out this week is The Words, which. I could tell from the first time I saw the trailer of this movie that this was a movie that CBS Films released it too, which is just a bad studio. They just released bad two-star movies. And this is a movie that thought thinks itself very intelligent, very intriguing, but it's actually very trite. So why don't you give us a summary of what the plot is? Well, it stars Bradley Cooper, Jeremy Irons, Dennis Quaid, Olivia Wilde, and Zoe Zalde Zaldana. Is that how you say it? The uh, layered romantic drama, um, The Words, follows young writer Rory Jensen, who finally achieves long sought after literary success after publishing the next, gener the next great American novel. There's only one catch. He didn't write it. As the past comes back to haunt him and his literary star continues to rise, J Jensen is forced to confront the steep price that he that must be paid for stealing another man's work and for and for placing ambition above something else morality probably so this is a film that could have been if handled well could have been awesome but if you just see the trailer to this movie i'm sorry it just looks terrible and the fact that bradley cooper who is best utilized when he doesn't take himself seriously because he is a good actor, great deliverer of dialogue, but when it, in, a, when it, in a raunchy comedy form. Uh -huh. This movie is well, not... Well, Jeremy Irons, too. It's just like... I love Jeremy Irons, but this just but sounds like a vehicle that... He, he's There's something so self-serious about mm -hmm. him. You know, like that. It, I would I would like to see Jeremy Irons in a comedy. Mm. You know what I mean? Well, I loved him in, in Reversal of Fortune, where that is kind of almost a comedy in some ways. Uh -huh. It's kind of like poking fun at himself. Yeah. With that, you know, the movie with Clyde, uh, uh, Claude uh, Von... Uh, Damn. Yeah, Claude Van Damme. <laughs> the, the movie where he's accused of, of killing his wife, Glenn Close. He won oh. Best Actor for it. Claude Von Barrow. Oh, yeah, I in, do remember that. In 1990, that and, that, and he's just so self-mocking. The last movie I saw Irons in that I really liked was that Margin Call movie that I just... Oh, yeah. yeah. That yeah, was I like so Margin good. Call. I mean, yeah. just that scene in the bathroom where he's like, we have to sell our shares. Oh, we are, we are screwed. <laughs> yeah, I could see him being good in that. I, I just find him... He's one of my top five. Uh, what? Actors? actors? Of all time? Of, uh, all of, of older male. Older oh. male actors right next to Jonathan Price. Hmm. I, I place oh. him... Well, he's a good actor and everything. It's just the casting and the films. It just he, sounds very trite. The films just kind of bore me sometimes. <laughs> and then uh, anyway, that one's got seventeen percent uh, with with the critics. So pretty much like a one and a half star film. Bachelorette yeah. is the last film that we are covering for the major openings. 
And that's a girl gross out bachelorette comedy. So Zav, why don't you give us a summary of that movie? Let's know what's happening. Okay. Um, that one, uh, on the night before an old friend's wedding, three frisky bridesmaids go searching for a little fun, but find much more than they bargained for. <laughs> Lovely Becky, played by Rebel Wilson, set to marry her handsome sweetheart, Dale Haynes MacArthur. The remaining members of her high school clique reunite for one last bachelorette, uh, Bacchan- Bacchanal? Bacchanal, in the Big Apple. Regan, Kristen, Kristen Dust, Dunst, mm-hmm. is an overachieving Uber maid of honor who's secretly smarting over the fact that she's not the first to marry, while Gina, dot, dot, dot. There is more. You can hit more. You don't uh, have to. Played by Lizzie Kaplan, is a whip smart sarcastic who's, oh, she's a whip smart sarcastic. I've never heard of a sarcastic before. Who's actually a closet romantic. And Katie, played by Ilsa Fisher, is a ditzy beauty who loves the good life. But when Becky insists on keeping the bachelorette party tame, the women proceed with an after hour celebration of their own. Oh, That's yeah. from their official site. So here is what. So far, it sounds. It sounds. It sounds actually pretty good, and it's and it's it supposed to kind of entertaining, kinda, but um. It's kind of it, it's, it's kind of, of a, a lesser bridesmaids is what I've been reading. Right, mm-hmm. right, right. Yeah, it's, so, it's just kind of pandering to. It seems pretty gross out comedy. Typical fair. In a typical, way. yeah. It has its moments, but Bla- Bachelorette ultimately plays it too safe with its, with its trio of unlikable leads. They all have just too many flaws, betraying them with a predictably sentimental final act that undermines moments of bracingly honest humor in the first two thirds. So here's a movie that actually is very independent, like like sort of like daringly made it at moments and has actual moments of truth and, and wisdom, but then undermines it with predictable mainstream crap. It's a 54%. I've been reading a lot of two and two star, two and, uh, two, I'm sorry, two star and two and a half star reviews. Some praising, some not so praising. Mm-hmm. I think this is another skip it movie. I think all three of our opening films here are, are pretty much skip ems. Yeah, I'm. I mean, I'm. I have I no. Mean, I have no interest in seeing these. I guess any of these films, but Bachelorette in particular seems like it depends on the writing. It could be good. You know, if you have some, if it's written well, it could be. I'll you probably know, see entertaining. it. I'll probably end up seeing it. Anyway, so this show we're doing some food movies, but first Zav and I are going to are going to cover a film that <laughs> took forever for us to see and that we'd been talking about for weeks and weeks. And it's the first film. That uh, someone requested we re- that we review. Yes, it's called Margaret, and, and it's I, that was Brian Tuma, I believe. Mm, that's right. That's Actually, right. made a request. He was listening mm-hmm. to our show, mm-hmm. and he wrote on a piece of paper and put it in our um, like we have a little box outside for notices, and 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 I opened it up and it was said, "Please review Margaret," which I guess it is probably Margaret. Now, no, I just I just always call it Mar- Margaret because it's also based on a on a sonnet by Shakespeare, I believe. Well, yeah, that, the sonnet from. gets read in the film, and that's what because I, I thought, you know, I thought the film, I thought her name was Margaret, mm-hmm. you know, the the character. But then I was like, wait, her name isn't Lisa. It's, it's Lisa or something mm-hmm. like that, and um, and and then, yeah, Margaret was uh, this poem that mm-hmm. they read. About a young woman, mm-hmm. I believe it's. You know, I listened to it a couple of times because I was like, okay, what? Why is this so critical to the film? Mm-hmm. Why is the film mm-hmm. named after this poem? And um, I still, even after listening two or three times to the poem um, within the context of the film, I still didn't completely grasp it. And that might just be me not being able to. I don't know. I don't know Shakespeare that well, or something. And I think it was meant to be kind of loose. It's pretty honest. loose, but I think that it, what it what it refers to in a way is, and this may be. I think this may be kind of what the film is about. Is is that when you're young, and you're you know you're just beginning to become an, an adult, you're that's when you're at your most idealistic, passionate, um, and open-minded stage of life in a way. Mm-hmm. Where you know you're an adult and yet you're still a child. You're ch- you have the creativity and the exploration of a child, mm-hmm. and 
yet you have the tools of an adult. You have the body of an adult. You, you're exploring sexuality, and you're uh, exploring uh, the adult world. You can interact with adults. You're no longer, you can be taken seriously. And in that moment, you know, you ideology, you know, if you, when you see something, that, and this is what Margaret does, or I'm sorry, what's her name again? Is it really Lisa? Are you sure? It's Lisa. You're sure? Absolutely. Okay. Somehow I thought it was something else. Um, Lisa. Um, played by Anna Paquin. A, played by Anna Paquin. Has she played in any other films that you know of? Oh yeah, she's a she won an Academy Award at the age of eight. She's the young, oh, she, she's wow. the second youngest Academy Award winner uh, for acting in history for the pi- for the piano in nineteen. Oh, she was the daughter. Or she's something? she's the daughter of Holly Hunter in the piano. Oh. She's also in Fly Away Home, which is a great family film from nineteen ninety seven. Uh huh. She's she's the main character in True Blood. She's the. Oh, I see. I haven't watched any True yeah, Blood. She's she's in True Blood, which has been her main focus for the last five years. Uh huh. This was a labor of love. This was Kenneth Lonergan. For those who don't know is the filmmaker who made You Can Count On Me and is, uh-huh. a, and is a celebrated Broadway du- uh, director of small, centralized uh-huh. um, 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 plays. And in fact, he kind of satirizes his own style of play directing in the film. because or he, he definitely refers, refers to it. refers to it. I don't it. think he satirizes it. I, I think, think it was kind of, it was, it was a little bit like, kind of like looking at the pretension of it and the world of it. Huh. I don't think, I, I didn't get that from it. I actually got... I actually got the sense that this was a very autobiographical film in mm-hmm. a way. I mean, I, obviously it's not his life, but it was something Some, connected something, to his yeah. world. Mm-hmm. And um, her mother is an actor on mm-hmm. Broadway, and uh, she has a big hit at the, towards mm-hmm. the end of the film, um, which I hope isn't giving away too much. No, but that's, um, like, that's like halfway through. Yeah. About halfway and, through. Um, but anyway, she's... she's uh, Talk about the bus accident. Oh, well, yeah... The, I forgot where I was going with it because actually what I was trying to get at is why is it called Margaret? It's based on this oh, poem. Sure, 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 and sure. the poem is so much about a person in their young y- years who's not willing to like give up morality for pragmatism mm-hmm. or for like what, you know, doing the right, th- do the right thing. Don't do the thing that's like more beneficial to mm-hmm. you financially and so on. Okay. So, so yes, this film is all about, you know the 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 plot the main plot point of the film at the beginning in the first i don't know 10 minutes or so is the this bus accident and a woman gets killed in front of her eyes and she mm-hmm. uh is it giving away too much am i giving That's away the very too beginning of the film to it's, say it's, that she basically movie, feels yeah. responsible mm-hmm. she and feels she, responsible she kind of is but it's, oh, it's i would it's say very she, she very much is is i just don't want to give away too much mm-hmm. and she and the bus driver are totally responsible for this. Mm-hmm. For this, I mean, as far as you can, th- that's what it is. It sort of gets into these moral questions of like, who's really responsible? Is it, you know, is it the person who walked in front of the bus? Is it the bus driver who didn't hit the brakes in time mm-hmm. because he was distracted? Is it the girl who distracted the bus driver? Mm-hmm. You could say everyone kind of played a role, you know. Mm-hmm. And in a court of law, that's kind of how things do work. But anyway, she this starts to just eat at her mind and. Towards the end, she just decides to to like uh, avenge the fact that at fir- her first reaction was to kind of protect the bus driver because she realized, well, this woman lost her life. She's not going to be. She can't save her. She can't bring her back to life. Mm-hmm. And um, and this bus driver, you know, do you want to take him down mm-hmm. along with it? And then in addition, maybe take her own. You know, it'd be kind of hard to like. She knew she was well. She knew she was responsible. I think she was the kind of person who would have claimed responsibility from the start because she's that kind of person. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, I thought it was a really interesting film, and I, I, I mean, I was, um, I was very, very glued to it, and um, and I was impressed by by the by the directing. Well, now I watched and and you did too the extended director's cut. Absolutely, which is. Maybe they take some liberties that you don't normally take in a film because there were liberties in there that I have n- not seen taken in this kind of a film before. Mm-hmm. Um, that I thought really made it interesting. Um, for example, the director, what's his name? Kenneth Lonigan. Kenneth Lonigan. Uh, he would um, focus on dialogue of the extras. In scene, overlapping dialogue, like Altman esque, like like there was like, an like, Altman quality, Altman esque quality yeah, in, in, Altman. in the diner, in the diner especially. Well, well not just the diner, in though. Many Throughout scenes. the film, many scenes, I you would hear yeah. the 
the the the extras, the mm-hmm. people who are just walking, you know, or having a coffee or mm-hmm. walking, the, you'd hear them more than you would hear the main actors. Mm-hmm. The main the for main like, for like three minutes at times. For like three well, minutes. I wouldn't say three minutes, but but for definitely for a, a good amount of time. I thought that was really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a scene. I don't know if you remember this, where she poops. Yep. Where she she sits down in a toilet and you hear her take. A, yeah. You hear the little splash of yep. a poop go in the toilet. Mm-hmm. I thought that was really strange. It was also strange because the first thing she does, it's like this kind of dramatic moment. And this is where I had kind of trouble with her, with the directing, was that at this kind of dramatic moment, she poops, mm-hmm. which seems strange to me because like, it just seemed unreal. It seemed like, why are you putting this? Why are you t- First of all, why are you doing this? Like, mm-hmm. It's a very risky thing to do in a film. Mm-hmm. Um, but why are you doing it at this moment where I don't think any, I don't think anyone would do that in no. a, you know, you're confronting someone. It's a very tense moment. You, they are ready. It's already very like, you don't want to, mm-hmm. I don't know. It didn't make a whole lot of sense that the first thing you say is, can I borrow your, can I use the bathroom? And then she goes in the bathroom, sits down and takes a crap. I thought that was kind of strange, mm-hmm. but, but, uh, and there were other things like that, that I thought were, okay, here's something I thought was very unusual. It didn't really, hold water for me about the film sure. the fact that she all of a sudden turned coat on him on this bu- a bus driver who she she sympathized with basically you know then she visits his home sees that she sees that he's a stressed person a stressed individual with multiple children he's doing everything to hold it together he's he's she knows she's very aware of her privilege as like a upper class new yorker mm-hmm. And his, and she's very aware of his, you know, being working class, and she doesn't want to destroy his life. Then she visits him, and from that moment on, she wants to just take him down. She wants to destroy him, and 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 bring him to justice. And I thought that was strange to me, that she, you know, I understood her need to like correct the record for herself and say I did this, I caused this accident, mm-hmm. and I lied on the, the the deposition or whatever it was, mm-hmm. but. For her to say, like, I want to take this guy down. I want him to never drive a bus again. Like, I I thought that was kind of strange to me. It was, seemed strange um, why it just didn't really, it didn't really seem consistent with who she was. So, I don't know. What do you think, Gabe? Well, I thought the film was a very disjointed, all over the place. And at times, there was way too much scope. And maybe not enough focus, but I think it's an accurate portrait of young, confused, sexual teenage monsters. And it's a brilliant look at high school. And Wait, it's what pro- do you mean monsters? Well, be- I think like the way that sex is used as a handshake is is kind of like disgusting. The way that it's like just like like the, the, that like common sexual practice has become like twelve years old now in, in some in some areas. Oh, and so I, just sort the of over sexualization, like but the I, but I think sexualization of teens in this era. But but I think her need to like almost feel accepted. But then there was there was something she really wasn't like honest that. about the sexuality. And that's, it was and almost that, in mm-hmm. some ways I thought and that's it was, what I. That's what I really liked was the yeah. was the honesty and the fact that this movie drove me nuts. But it's a brilliant, full psychological portrait of someone who is flawed, right. has has a lot of emotional problems, is not a perfect person, and does terrible, awful things yeah. emotionally to her mother. And I think that that's a huge part of it is that yeah. there's multiple sides to her. One right. side of her like sympathizes with this guy, but also wants to destroy him when he doesn't see eye to eye with her. I mean, in some ways, this is, you know, like like the left, right, um, ups and downs and bipolar craziness of being a teenager. Yeah. And that's what I thought was so brilliant was and very, accurate about vivid, this film. All over the place. And very I felt, close. I felt like there was something so, mm-hmm. it was almost, um, you know, you just wondered, like, how did they write this? Where did mm-hmm. this come from? It's so... It's so um, authentic, mm-hmm. it felt like Lone, to me. Yeah. It's interesting that you say your girlfriend hated it. Well, because it, it just drove her nuts, the way that it just kept going, and she couldn't make up her mind, and she kept talking. Well, what should I do? I just can't figure it out. But she could not stop watching it. She's like, uh-huh. and every time I'd be like, well, I can watch this later. She's like, well, we might as well just finish it. <laughs> uh-huh. And yeah. so, you know, and I, and I never told her that it's three hours long. I, yeah. I, I checked the display on the DVD menu, and I was like, when we were 40 minutes in, I was like, oh, God, this movie's just taking. And I saw that we had two hours and 15 minutes left. And I said, yeah. she goes, how much is left? I said, oh, about 45 minutes. And then she just was like, man, this is just taking forever. And I'm like, yeah, this movie is really challenging. And 
Um, what I guess I, I just was, I was so drawn in by the last third of this film. And what I thought was the most beautiful thing about this movie was the random scenes of lights in New York City, the random shots of the New York buildings, the cityscapes. There's yeah. a scene where they're on Jean Re where his mom, where her mother is on Jean Reno's balcony, and there's just this effortless pan of the city and it just goes on for about 15 or 20 seconds and it's just perfect i mean it mm -hmm. just encapsulates the frustration and the beauty of living in new york yeah the loneliness yeah. and 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 it the does, sense of community it gave, it gave me a sense of it really felt like new york mm -hmm. to watch this film absolutely kind of like a woody allen film but more so because of the length i think mm -hmm. and because of the lack of it wasn't i mean the plot was a big deal but and it was driving the movie. It definitely is a very, like, it's not a boring three no, hours. No, not at to all. To me, at least. It was not boring. But it's not, you know, Woody Allen, he's so good at what he does. He's so good at his craft of storytelling that sometimes I don't feel like, like I'm experiencing New York as much. Or a real movie. I, I'm like experiencing an unreal world. Absolutely. But her world was felt very real. It's, um, it's interesting you bring that up because I was reading recently that Woody Allen is actually, I mean, he's a science fiction writer. He's a science fiction filmmaker. Most of his movies are actually like fantasy or science fiction, and they would really? never be considered. What, what Alice, uh, um, um, Midnight in oh, Paris is right. a fantasy. I see what you're saying. There's mystical realism in it. Yeah, yeah. Sleeper. Well, I wouldn't, I think, well, Sleeper is, he I, actually, that would be the one science fiction. He actually was talking with Harlan Ellison about, and, and uh, the Purple Rose of Cairo. His films often do have some mm -hmm. he was, thing that happens in the film that's magical. He was talking magical about realism. with Harlan Ellison actually in the 80s, why haven't I been nominated or ever won the Hugo Award? I write science fiction films. He was upset about it actually at one point in the 80s. Uh -huh. and around 1986 or so, he was wondering why the heck he hadn't won this award yet and why uh, he'd never even been nominated. I science part. Well, science. just science fiction or fantasy, which is yeah. which, which which in the Hugo Awards is loped is loped together. Uh -huh. It's one or the other. It's just that that element of unreality of right. of that jump into fantasy. Uh, right. And anyway, we're getting off we're getting off subject there. But New York has that sort of magical world about it and i think this movie is just i mean this movie is un I, it's just it's yeah. just its own world it really encapsulated new york better than yeah. almost any movie since manhattan and and in, in, you know in terms of like really finding the essence of that city and, yeah. and how it yeah, affects I would say, us because i don't i mean I, I think that what the thing about new york is it's not a magical world it's a real world it's yeah. real and there are real bad sides to to it for example everyone is cramped in these little apartments you know and it all you know they're kind of getting on each other's nerves him she and her mother and her little brother just drive each other crazy because they're cramped in this tiny little yeah. new york apartment you know that's one of the realities of new york the other one is is the fact that the mother i don't know there's something about like a lot, a lot of life in new york is spent in the streets shopping walking in the sidewalks and so on not much there's not much of a warm home place to be. There's not a very, it's not a very comfortable place to just hang out at home all the time. Um, uh, and then there's also a thing about just kind of like um, people who are a little, ex you know, extreme in New York. There's, there's a lot of extreme people, mm -hmm. very powerful people, people with um, a lot of wealth, and then people with extreme poverty all mushed together in one place. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and that puts a lot of pressure on people. Just yeah. the idea that, you know, you're constantly surrounded with type A personalities, with people who, you know, explode with with emotion and so on because they're just sort of, like, used to getting everything their way. And, um, and I, so I don't know. I mean, there's just – there are positives and negatives. So I don't Absolutely. see New York as being a magical place. I think of it as a place that's got all mm -hmm. kinds of problems as well as all kinds of – obviously a great and amazing thing absolutely i guess when i say magical i just mean surreal like i don't mean it's, or it's other, pretty other, pretty or beautiful other to us mm -hmm. other, other to, to like us Milwaukee, yeah yeah, we, yeah you know for us it is to be in a place like new york is is a very different experience and mm -hmm. for most people in the world mm -hmm. it is sort of like the center of or it has been up until recently kind of like the center of the world mm -hmm. sort of like this the capital of the world um so did we cut? What, what else Ooh. should we talk about with Margaret? Is it, we, we I think we pretty it. much covered we it, man. It. We yeah, I think we nailed one. it. Okay. So, yeah. We got that. We're one. critics. Oh, did we want to? <laughs> I did have a clip. Well, should we play this one? Clip? Sure. We have a, we have about eleven minutes for 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 food films. 
Should I play the clip? Yeah. All right, I'm gonna play the clip. It might get cut off at the beginning, but we're it's gonna fine. try. Yeah, like 20, 20 minutes? Um, okay. yeah, is Detective Mitchell here? Yeah, Oh. Um, I talked to him on Monday, and he said he'd be here after three. Yeah, he's not back yet. Can I help you with something? Um, well, do you know when you expect him? What's this about? I was involved in an accident a few weeks ago, uh -huh. and I filled out a report with Detective Mitchell, but I wanted to amend the report, well, so I... Well, you want to amend it. How do you want to amend it? Well, there was something I didn't tell him, and I wanted to tell but him because... I don't because... understand. You want to change your statement? Yes. Yes, I want to change my statement. Yes. Well, you would usually have to talk to the investigating detective on the case. Yes. I know. That's why I asked to see Detective Mitchell, who said he'd be here now, but he's not, so... You the case number? No. Sorry. Uh, it was that woman, Monica Patterson, who got run over by the bus on Broadway. Okay. It was yeah, in a sure. lot of the okay. newspapers. Okay, sit down, sit down. Thank you. I... You know the case is closed. I assumed it was, but part of the reason it's closed is because of my statement and the because statement... Because of your I... statement? Yes. What do you mean it was closed because of your statement? I mean, I was the... The DA's office closes the case. You don't close the case. The DA's office closes the case. I'm sure it does. I obviously didn't mean I personally closed it. Like, legally, I meant that what I said was probably instrumental in getting What's the case your name, closed. What's I... Lisa Cohen. Okay. Don't call me honey, okay? Well, that's a good example of, of kind of just how she is. It's like she's this person who is in this adult world and kind of, like, aghast at how um, sort of stubborn and unmovable people are and yeah. how, you know, there's a, an obvious wrong. It needs to be fixed. Absolutely. And yet there's this sort of, just sort of, well, in this case, it's bureaucracy, but the adult world just seems sort of, like, staid and unmoving and un... It, it, it's just in her way. It's in the way of justice. It's in the way of getting things right. And yet at the same time, for example, she talks about how she hates opera at a certain point in the film. And then at the end of the film, she, you know, like opera suddenly is, you know, this beautiful thing that she discovers. So, so she's becoming an adult. She's kind of like becoming part of that as well. Like as the, as the, as she, yeah. you know, grows older in, you know, within this experience, um, okay, here's another one last little thing about Margaret that I felt was inconsistent. Um, she has this traumatizing experience where it's like she holds someone who dies. Someone dies in her arms. She comes home. She, you know, she's obviously upset and everything. But then the next night, she's already sort of back to sort of laughing and charmed and mm -hmm. charming and kind of back to who she was before. And I feel like a thing like that would would just really linger with you for a long time and I just felt like she kind of went she sort of didn't it didn't really sink in with her the way that I think a, a real human being it would but with her character it didn't seem to sink in enough that this thing you know really would have would have traumatized you um, I don't know she didn't seem shaken enough by the by the experience in certain ways there were certain things about it that didn't didn't hold together for me but i think that's what i liked about the film too is that the director seemed to just be going like not afraid to kind of just go with whatever idea in a way and and not he wasn't too concerned about the fact that like not everything was holding together too well because generally in the end you got the gist of it you got this feeling of what the film was supposed to be about, which I think was about adolescent, like becoming part of the adult world, and and how the, the adult world is, you know, all your illusions sort of get shattered one by one, and then you finally become this sort of adult, you know. Um, anyway, um, let's move on to the food movies. El Bulli and Kings of Pastry, which. Kings of Pastry is a film directed by D.A. Pen Pennebaker and Chris Hedges. D.A. Pennebaker coming to world-renowned fame as a filmmaker of numerous musicians, most notably Bob Dylan in the film Don't Look Back, which put Bob Dylan as a v video or as a um, sort of a filmed icon as well as a musical icon as well. He'd also done this before in, in, in his movies about the, the Newport 
uh, folk festival, which he'd filmed every year for years and years and released as a documentary in 1975, I believe. And he incorporated about 10 years of footage in that movie, a lot of it with Joan Baez. He's primarily considered one of the main influences on the British neorealist movement and the British documentary movement, considered the primary figure, um, but and inspired a lot of other British filmmakers in the stripped down, very stark, very simple black and white view, right. but also uh, a very great um, music filmmaker. He also made a, a great documentary about Depeche Mode in the late 80s. Mm -hmm. He's made other David documentaries Bowie. and David Ziggy Bowie Stardust. and Ziggy Stars, yeah, and and lots of other uh, music films. Uh, he also made a film with Chris Hedges in the early '90s called The War Room, which is a oh yeah great documentary. And El Bully is a stripped down documentary, which Zav pointed out is just literally like like film verite, like almost to its core. And I, I yeah, actually, agree with you. No, know, if you talk about really verite, um, I would say that El Bully, well. I, I I did see the Penna Baker feeling in um, the Kings of Pastry. Yeah. Um, but in El Bulli, uh, I, yeah, the Verte. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's at this point Verte is almost an accepted form. It's something that yeah, you, you pretty a standard, much standard. It, just a, yeah, it's pretty standard mm -hmm. um, fare for for mm -hmm. um, documentary filmmaking. Mm -hmm. And l luckily, there was no. The good thing is there were no like steel guitars. Thank <laughs> God, no steel guitars. Um, but uh, let's talk about well, which one? Let's talk about El Bulli because we well, we both watched both of them sure. actually. Uh, actually, in compare, uh, just to compare. I mean, yeah. I think I put I would much prefer, I much preferred El Bulli I to completely Kings of agree. Pastry. I think that there was a, a, a craft completely agree to uh, the craftsmanship to, to El Bulli, yeah. and I think. To be fair, I mean, to be really fair, I just think the subject was more interesting. Absolutely. I think that El Bulli, the, the restaurant, um, is just a far more fascinating subject mm -hmm. than um, the pastry competition that happens. Mm -hmm. And or it's every three years in it's, France. It's every four years. Every four years in France to, um, to choose the best. The MOF. Yeah, the, the MOF. Which the, is considered the, like the, 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 the absolute end-all competition of pastry chefs and dessert chefs and it in, in a lot of ways it's considered an end all of food in the world so kings of pastry is, a, but is how could it be an end all of food it's, it's really mostly on pastry post, uh, but in terms of but, but in terms of decoration and and yeah. preparation yeah. and of, of visual splendor of mostly right. dealing with the visual preparation of yeah. height texture and color right that's a main component of the of the artistic and the eyes however there is a nine course tasting competition in the, in that component and everything has to taste perfect mm -hmm. but it has to be unique so kings of pastry is about the mof competition in france that's held every four years uh, following it's four or five but mostly two guys very closely as mm -hmm. they compete for this title which is just very prestigious and it's more famous and more widely known in france than it is yeah in the states it's almost like the olympics of pastry it is it's it's at, it's on the level mm -hmm. almost on the level mm -hmm. of like an olympic athlete um and, and it's it it's uh what was i gonna say about <laughs> it i just it it was well made the guys are very I like seeing these chefs. I feel like I understand it. And actually, you know, the two blend in my mind. It really, I suggest watching both of them. I think they're both good films. Mm -hmm. um, and, and El Bulli is about um, El Bulli, the restaurant, which is right now considered the most prominent, profound, and influential restaurant in the world. It's outside of Barcelona. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, um, I, I, agree, I agree exactly with what you were saying, that, that they're both grand works of art. Right. El Bulli looks better, uh, just from visually. Visually speaking, El Bulli is just better shot. The, the uh, uh, Kings of Pastry is shot on video. Uh, a lot of the imagery is kind of grainy looking. Grainy, even on even watching it on a laptop, it was grainy. So I can't mm -hmm. imagine watching it in a theater. Dry, very detached. But I mean, it was literally great. I'm saying it, it was just literally bad, using yeah. a video camera. Yeah, it, didn't, you know? it, so it was not, it, it was it not looked, polished. It looked fine, but it looked like a TV show. It was more content know? based. It was more about the food. Um, well, I, I would say it was less focused on capturing um, there was just something missing from Kings of Pastry that El Bulli really brought to life. Right. And we were talking Kings about this before. Kings of Pastry also, I would say, is kind of like a lot of films these days. You know, there's there's a lot of... Um, in fact, 
you know, this is something I've just, it just hit me. There's just something about competitions of mastery, mastery competitions, competition, for example, um, Project Runway. It's a really similar type of thing. People who are competing at these like extreme levels of, of couture, you know, to become the best cook or uh, clothing couture and they're given like certain materials and they have to like come up cooking with cooking shows and then cooking yeah there's all the the iron chef stuff there are so top many chef, different top chef all of that master stuff. chef i mean yeah we have we have tons of them in the, in the store here just all these different uh cooking competition shows um so and i'm sure there are others i'm you know just, that was just like off the top of my head but i know that it's been you know they talked about doing one for art and for um for any you could probably pick any subject you know mm -hmm. the car racing or whatever it is and yep. just kind of do a documentary about the top person and competing and so in a way it just feels like another one of those films to me um it, it has a really similar kind of narrative sure. arc to it you know where like someone tries really hard and then their thing falls apart and then it's like they're really upset and then you but then they come back and it's okay and they even though they lose, they it, they still gain something out of it. El Bulli doesn't do any of that. It's not about that. It's it's a film about avant-garde cuisine. Yeah. And it's bizarre. I mean, it's like nothing you've ever seen. I mean, you might have heard an NPR thing about something similar, you know, where they make lollipops out of, like, uh, olive oil that is, like, deep frozen and... But it's it's really interesting. I feel like what's the chef's name? You you have a much better retention. I for can't names. remember his name, but he is right now the most revered chef. I mean, I'd say he's in the top three of the, of the most revered chefs in the world right now. And in, in and I would say he's borderline insane. Oh, I, I well I, I would say that, that <laughs> like just that, that observing his level. His I mean, level he's on of, this level of he's a little bit like a crazy dictator or something. But, but he's, he has to he's be. Not, he's benign. He's not a mean dictator. But he's, he smiles but a lot. I love when he smiles. He's a, he's a, but he's just so fixed on his craft, yep. and it's and his whole and, life, you know, it's, 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 just, it's so bizarre because when it finally, you know, that when they're finally serving this stuff, you realize how if you just sat, if you if you just arrived at this restaurant and you were some regular Joe Blow off the street and you were sitting down at El Bulli, and they served you like a plate with a few little pieces of. Um, uh, pine needles, some pine, pine sprouts. Pine sprouts from a pine tree here. in pine water with in pine water with like an olive oil cocktail that have been who knows maybe maybe you know they've been treated in gastronomized some, yeah get, something very special has happened with yeah. them but they hand you a plate with some pine needles and then you eat them and you know just the idea of how some people mm -hmm. would just observe that as the height of pretentious of pretentious. Yeah. Yeah. Like Emperor's New Clothes, like there's nothing, there's no, yeah. there's nothing. Where's the beef, you know, type but, of thing. But, but at the same time, I just think it's absolute. It's 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 the new cuisine. It's the experience. It's the full range. It's the full right. identity. It's the full spiritual experience of eating, where it's not just the food and the sustenance. It's the full identity and the full rush. And it's like a, it's almost like like this like this mystery. Like it's a book. Like it's a movie. Like it's 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 almost like chasing a girl and yeah. then having disappointments and then thrills and rushes and how he talked about the experience i mean this is a four-hour eating experience this is like a 20 course meal sometimes yeah. like a 30 course meal 36 36 course meal yeah. and so at the end he's like we have to end with this rush with this excitement we have to we have to stab them in the eye and he's just <laughs> and it's just like his pa i mean i think his eyes were my favorite character in the whole film mm -hmm. besides his main sous chef who is yeah. who lives at the restaurant who yeah. has no they what never talk the about it you wonder how this man is just working so all of them. Yeah, all of them all are working them all so year round. hard. They have no life. Yeah. There's no possibility for having a wife. There's no possibility for having a child. There's no possibility for anything. Whereas Kings of Pastry, one thing I liked about it was is it showed that they are fathers and that they have houses and they they have wives and they have mm. this whole other life that they're not yeah, you get just to see a them. chef. Well, you do get to but see they have to these sacrifice guys. A lot of that. You do get to see these guys a little bit, but yeah, you never about really a minute. see the main chef who I can't believe we neither of us can remember his name. Um, what's that? Oh, uh, yeah, I'll look it up. Uh, but um, uh, 
yeah, you don't really get the backstory of who they are that much, but you do you do get to With see the them shopping. Yeah. yeah, you get to see them out of their chef clothes, uh, shopping. And they're and just so like, and they, you know, and just outside of this, they're still all about food. Every second of their life is absorbed with food, and it's about this restaurant. Even outside of the rest, even outside of the restaurant when they're shopping, it's all about well, what's going to be in season in September? What's going to be in season in October? Oh, come on, tell me. And even when they're joking around and they're playful, and they're just having these effervescent, natural, real moments. It's completely <laughs> absorbed and revolved around what the chef needs and what the restaurant needs. I right. mean, and literally in the one... And can we just, for one second, let me just add that you work, I mean, you work for a chef, you work at Roots, yeah. right? And so you, you, this is something that you've got a pretty intimate experience with, right? Just You're, being absorbed in food culture yeah. and, and, and chefs. Because um, I, mean, I would say Roots is a little bit like the El Bulli of, well, no, no, the, no, ours would be Sanford's. Sanford and Roots are, are the closest. But Sanford's is way beyond Roots. Just because <laughs> I'm not saying I'm not saying it in a critical way. I'm just saying I, I've eaten at Sanford's once, once, and you don't just walk in there. Yeah, you don't. You have to have. I'm not saying it's better in, in any way. In fact, let me just tell you, my experience at Sanford was I was irritated. Yeah, I thought it was bogus. They were just telling me all these like the chef came up with this thing and he thought of this neat thing and he put he put you know he decided to put framboise with with steak or I don't know steak juice but then on ice cream or something you know and I was sort of like whatever this is the kind of stuff my friends and I did you know like I, I'm sorry I'm sounding I'm sounding anti uh, like I'm not I'm not that kind of person I'm not someone who thinks that that stuff is all bogus but at the same time I was non uh, I was not impressed I was not as impressed by Sanford's as I expected because you know it's like a hundred dollar meal and it's really hard to get in and all of that so and uh, but anyway you work at Roots and Roots is one of the I would say another one is Bartolata's and the other one in Milwaukee is uh, Cro Coquette which I love Coquette yeah, yeah, it's a French restaurant. It's considered very good. I mean, they have a high standard. I, I, yeah. would, say, I would say Roots, Roots, Sanford, um, Lake Park, um, and Bacchus. Oh, and oh, and 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 hinterland. Uh huh. And um, but Sanford is Sanford, Sanford is, is Sanford, Sanford is the Sanford one. Is the highest like if you're just a snobby far. person and you want to go to the, the most Sanford. snobby restaurant in go Milwaukee, to you're gonna go to Sanford. You go to Sanford. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so anyway, you have had experience in this world, a and it's bit. very similar to that. And I kept thinking about my about about the chefs I've worked under at Roots while I was watching this, and the devotion and the dedication to within a price range because Roots mm -hmm. Roots has to stay affordable for like uh, for. It has to be a nice experience and a quality experience, but it has to remain somewhat affordable. So we have to think about same within a price range, but they're always daring, they're always questioning, they're always experimenting with flavors that would that that go together well, but that are unusually paired. Mm -hmm. they, it, it, it's a new take on classical cuisine, and it's and it's a fusion cuisine. It's an intercontinental, and they're fusing these things together, and they're taking sort of this new cuisine, this new idea of right. of, and especially uh, Chase Anderson, who's the um, uh, the pastry chef there who is absolutely just doing things with the dessert menu and with um, molecular gastronomy and with just great cooking and great craftsmanship and just a great love and passion of food that uh, and and chef dan as well both are doing unusual but very classical things at the same time to to create this this new dance with food and i was just watching this movie and i'm just thinking like man like i just feel i just felt so lucky that i get to work with people who while they're not like revered on the level as them, I was just like, I get to work with that same type of creativity. And I just felt very lucky that I get to work around that. And sometimes it's not always pleasant, <laughs> but uh -huh. it's, as Chase Anderson might be listening to the show, but it's, it's, I always feel uh, honored to, to, to be in the presence of it. Ferran Adria is the uh, chef that we're Ferran. talking about. Ferran, that's right. Ferran, that's right. That, that's Ferran. right. That's right. He's just he's just uh, if, for food snob, that's just, he's just like the like the that beyond revered. In fact, someone was talking about using pork shoulder juice on something and using like calf marrow and something and then and then someone kind of jokingly said i think that's on el bully's menu and then i said i just watched that yesterday we're doing a food show today and I, <laughs> and it was just kind of funny it was just like just how common that lingo is like just referring to that menu or referring to that height of food excellence is like if you do something crazy or if you do something like extremely creative yeah it's like it's like sarcastically See, immediately this like, is the thing about ferran's 
approach, and we have to wrap this up in, in the next 20 seconds or so. <laughs> um, what I like about his approach is that he is like a really, he reminds me of a real artist. Mm. And, and I don't say that kind of thing lightly. He, he, it really feels like someone who doesn't really care. So like someone could say, oh yeah, it's really pretentious. It, it, maybe it is a little bit pretentious, like on the level of like a Matthew Barney or uh, Damien Hirst type of artist. But he really does have kind of like that artist feeling. He is an artist. I yeah. agree. I think you're absolutely right. But we got to wrap it up. This was and another that's episode. that's what I didn't like about the Ch Kings of Pastry. They didn't seem like artists to me. They, they seem like people Ooh. just do... I just super hardcore. Whatever. They, like I said before, they're like Eagle Scouts. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks. We got to wrap it up. This is our food and, show. Uh, we'll see you next check week. Check out uh, those films and see you soon. Bye. Bye.